my name's Mark Jackard. I'm a professor in Vancouver, Canada, and I'm the chair of, uh, or the moderator for this session. Uh, welcome, and uh, we'll get right at it. We've got, uh, we have three speakers, but they're divided into five speakers, so you do the math. And, and, and they've, I think they're doing it to befuddle me on time limit constraints and things like that, but I've written it all down. So, um, and each of the speaker, the three speaker groups has 10 minutes, uh, and I'm gonna keep them really close to that. And so some of them have split up their time. After each group has spoken, uh, unless you have a question that really focuses on something you didn't get, or, you know, explanatory about one of the slides, uh, like a very, very focused question about what they said, uh, otherwise I'm going to move us on and so ask you to save it to the very end. So I, I possibly will entertain questions after individual units of speakers, but um, I, won't let, I won't give you a long leash with that, all right? So now uh, I would like to start uh, right away then with our first speakers, uh, and that's um, Jenny Liu, uh, who's with the Science Policy Research Institute at Sussex, where she's a research fellow, and, uh, and then followed, uh, or in collaboration with Ashwin Pong, who's with HSBC um, Glo Global Research Department to uh, the Climate Change Center. So, Jenny, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I think we had a very engaging and interesting conversation earlier. So I'm not going to try to repeat elements on our slides that we've already touched today and try to focus on more detailed components since I only have five minutes. So this presentation is um, um, a collaboration of industry and academia and we came together and the first part of the presentation, we're going to really give you a moral and ethical understanding of what divestment means. So this is a branching off a little bit of the discussion that we had earlier from Sivan. And um, then we'll go into the economic arguments and taking a look at a bottom-up approach. So divestments, the framing of that first section, we're going to look at the social and environmental motivation. So as we spoke earlier this morning, there is the policy drivers at the national, uh, international, and at regional levels at the European Union. So we won't go into that area, but we're going to focus a bit more on the economics, the de materialization of the economy. And this is something that Maria brought up earlier. So what does that mean? We want to develop um, economically with using fewer and fewer resources. So this means that we might need technology to help us alongside with that. This could be new technologies, energy efficiency, low carbon technologies, carbon capture stores. So it's a huge option, but we have this huge problem of climate change. And the scale of transition that we need is massive. We need deep social and institutional changes to drive the underlying motivations of all parts of our economy. So this techno-economical paradigm needs to shift from a current high carbon intensive, which is the ICD paradigm, beginning from the 17th till now, to something that is green. What does that look like? So we're just going to explore, well, possibly divestments might perhaps offer a potential opportunity where there could be opportunities and investments and profits. Just give a very broad history. Divestment is not something new. It's happened in the 1900s, early 1900s, motivated uh, by ethical and moral arguments from the church. This started in Europe, Nordic countries, the US, the UK. Uh, onto the mid-1900s, you have a discussion more so of ethical industries that you're trying to um, avoid, sin industries, so it could be tobacco, arms, and later on, the apartheid in South Africa. But this evolved from social um, and moral, let's say, uh, issues into broader environmental issues in the late um, 1990s. And this became particularly relevant with the Brundtland uh, Report, Our Common Future, and the definition of sustainable development. So divestments begin to look into something that's a bit broader than just social. In 2011, the divestment movement started from the bottom up, actually from university students. And it was an issue of mountaintop coal removal. And it began to spread across universities, NGOs picked it up, and very renowned environmentalists. And then such as the United Nations, begin to capture this, this divestment movement is something significant. We're actually going to mobilize private, public funds in order to transition globally 
into a high carbon um, energy uh, model that we have into something that's clean and sustainable. So there's a lot of numbers out here. I just want to focus on a few components. In the last two years, we've seen this divestment moving from um, probably nine, uh, 70 different institutions, nonprofit and for-profit institutions, over 500 that have divested. And this has been um, notable since the Paris Agreement. And it's not just this nonprofit um, sector that has been really interesting, but the for-profit, which we're going to discuss in the last half. So the Rockefeller Brothers um, Fund, this is worth millions. Nord's Bank, this is worth billions. AXA redefining uh, um, the AXA insurance, worth over a trillion in terms of assets management. So these are not insignificant uh, players that are divesting. Uh, we see that there's a growth of over 8% in for-profit institutions. And there's also, from the individual scale, over five billion have pledged to be divested. So this is just from the, from the bottom up movement. It's really beginning to gain traction. Why is this unlike any other divestment movement? Because in the past, it was restricted to particular countries, to Sudan, to South Africa, to tobacco. And now, fossil fuels and energy is addressing an uh, ethical issue of climate change, inter generational equity, interspecies equity. It's no longer one sector, it's cross-country, cross-sector. And the cumulative campaign outflow since 2014 is 15 billion. In 2016, it's 3.4 trillion. It is not insignificant. So the questions that were asked earlier today, where are we going to get money to fund low carbon sources? So are we going to bankrupt these big players, these huge institutions that have um, this, this uh, distinct and entrenched pathway? Probably not, but the outflows may be invested in perhaps low carbon technology, renewable technologies. So the next half of the presentation will give you a little bit more detail. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so that was the more interesting part, uh, really. Um, ethics are one driver for divestment, of course, and the other factors, as Jenny's touched on, are those really which can disrupt the energy system. So if you think about energy supply um, and all the types of supply going to energy demand, um, investors are really interested in what can change those flows. So uh, the speed of change, the, the size of the change of flow, and where the market has mispriced assets as a result of miscalculating how quickly those flows can change. The energy system is always in transition, but at the moment um, the transition is very much focused on, the, um, on fossil fuels in the supply side and on some of the demand technologies which take those in. Um, and so. Divestment of fossil fuels is one way of approaching that, and investors have taken different types of divestment approach, and um, we're going to look at that in a little bit of detail now um, with some divested portfolios. So, um, sorry. Right, thanks. Um, so the questions for an investment for an investor are: first of all, what to screen out. Now, you can screen out different parts of the fossil fuel supply chain. So there's oil and gas and there's coal. And you can start to look at service companies. So that's, I mean, for some names like Halliburton and Schlumberger who take all their revenue from serving um, oil, um, oil and gas production. And you can look at some of the users as well. So some divestment has focused on coal-fired utilities, for instance. Um, in, this, in this exercise, we're focused on the supply side. And then there's the question of what you do with the money. So do you reinvest it into the screened index or do you put it into environmentally um, positive solutions? We're starting to see a bit of that coming through. The Guardian Media Group, for instance, said it would divest from all fossil fuels and put that divested cash into environmentally positive stocks. Um, also, AXA Group have said that they'd take some of the coal, uh, the coal divestment money and put it into environmental stocks as well. Um, and then what about, what about performance? What are the metrics to consider? So here we look at total return, which is, um, for those that know, um, share price performance, and dividends on top. Uh, and we also try to consider volatility a little bit, and we use the Sharpe ratio here. It's one measure of volatility. It's essentially the performance of the portfolio minus the risk-free rate divided by the standard deviation of the portfolio. Um, and of course, volatility is very important to um, investors who need to pay regular money from, from, from an endowment or a pension fund over time. Um, just to give it a quick kind of 10 seconds of real world context here, in my previous role, a couple of years ago, I worked with Newton Investment Management um, it's one of the leading um, uh, managers of charity and a university endowment money. Uh, and we started to get a lot of questions in kind of early 2014 about divestment. What would it look like for their portfolios if they'd not held um, uh, fossil fuel and fossil fuel exposed stocks? Um, and so I back tested their portfolios, took in the findings to show them and indeed had some positive responses. A couple of those clients have since divested. Um, so 
Let's look at some of these portfolios now, what they actually look like. So the first set is a bit simpler. It's um, divesting stocks from these fossil fuel supply sectors. So first of all, oil and gas, then the, the service companies, and then taking the metals and mining sector out as well. Now that's a more difficult um, one as a sector on the whole, as a, for, for, on the whole because um, that includes coal, but it also includes other large com commodities, of course, like iron ore. Um, looking at these results, we can see yeah, um, I'll talk loudly. Outperformance on a 10-year basis. However, over a five-year basis, outperformance. Time frames are very important because it kept the 10-year crisis um, and the 5-year period um, kind of starts. We did this up to September 2014, and so it's kind of after the, the worst parts of the financial crisis, and so it misses out that period of kind of extreme market volatility. Um, the sharp ratios are also interesting here. You can see that, um, so a higher, higher score is better. And you can see invested stocks, i.e. On, on, um, uh, on a risk-weighted performance, that they, they, they score better on that ratio. Um, the next set of portfolios is, um, uh, sorry, I've gone too far. Um, um, these are the ones where we've reinvested into green stocks or the FTSE ET50 as a proxy for that. So that's a 50 stock index which holds environmental technology stocks. Uh, so a lot of renewables in there really. Um, and um, the results here, not great. Um, we'll kind of talk, touch on why uh, in a minute. But uh, you can see outperformance if you'd stayed in um, rather than divested and reinvested into that green proxy. However, there's a, a, again one of the sharp ratio scores. Divested index over 10 years. Um, the next one, um, the last set of portfolios, are the tilted portfolios. So here we've taken out selections of oil companies. To do that, we've used um, the Carbon Tracker Initiatives research, which looked at um, companies which had most exposure to um, oil production, which has got um, a break-even price of $80 per barrel or more. And so it, it takes out a lot of Arctic production, um, oil sands, and, um, uh, and ultra-deep water. Uh, on the coal side, we've looked at, any, at the 20 companies with the largest coal production by volume. Um, and here it, it, it's a bit more interesting. You can see outperformance uh, in five years for portfolios um, which are taken out the screen, um, the screen for oil and gas, selects oil and gas companies, and better sharp ratios overall. Now, um, the next slide. Oops. Pretty small detail, but that huge spike out in the middle, that red line there, is the ET50. So you can see a lot of froth around um, these environmental stocks kind of pre crisis, and then it came crashing back down. Over a 10 year period, you can see some of that dip there. But what you can see over the last few years to 2014 is that it again started effectively, it came down here and then started to track. Um, kind of concluding comments very quickly, oops, sorry, um, are that this, the time frame is obviously crucial and the sharp ratios were probably a stronger divestment signal than total return, uh, particularly actually on the back test of portfolios of different clients. But this exercise was backward looking. Uh, the energy system is in kind of rapid transition at the moment, I would argue, particularly around fossil fuels, and it failed to capture the last two years of very continued continue suppressed oil prices. A lot of people keep projecting they'll go back up for various reasons they haven't done. Um, and then we have other catalysts as well, so in policy, clean tech, you know, was failed by Copenhagen, you could argue was supported by the Paris Agreement, and then future disruption around Paris, we're probably going to get ratification this year, reviews and ratchets along the way. Clean tech keeps on getting cheaper and cheaper, um, and we have new technologies on the clean tech side as well. Um, thank you very much. Great. Um, okay. Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Lucas. I work for the Oxford Smith School um, in the Sustainable Finance Program. Uh, so we have a project that we've been working on with Chatham House and E3G, uh, looking at pathways for international oil companies to transition um, to, to a two-degree constraint, essentially, um, and what that means for uh, their capital allocation, their dividend policy, um, and any business model diversification. Um, and the first step in this exercise was to really go through the gray literature of, uh, of energy scenarios and outlooks um, to identify what the differences are between um, sort of the central scenarios and what the two degree scenarios are 
Um, so I'm going to present sort of some of that, uh, a survey of, um, of those outlooks um, and just walk you through um, some of our findings. Um, so Ingrid couldn't be here today, but I do, I do encourage you to have a look at the paper. Um, and I'm going to, I apologize in advance, there's going to be lots of charts and graphs as we run through the slides. Um, but we're trying to put everything together into a data pack, so if you want either the slides or the actual underlying data, please reach out and we can uh, provide those to you. Um, so these are the scenarios and the outlooks that we looked at. Um, so you can see here I've sort of delineated uh, all the different publication years, um, so some of them going back quite, quite a while. Um, uh, what, what else do we have to say? Um, so uh, not the most recent ones aren't all from 2016, so some are pre-Paris, some are post-Paris, um, and this isn't a complete universe of the different scenarios of all these different organizations, uh, just the ones that are more recent that we find relevant. Um, and I think we see two things immediately, that there are more scenarios more recently, um, especially since the implications of a carbon constraint have become clear, and then especially since 2014, we even have these low oil price scenarios starting to enter the gray literature, so we think that's a really good sign. Um, so how did we do this exercise? We went through uh, all the outlooks. We collected everything from the data appendices that we could that were comparable. We used um, data point uh, apps to, um, to pick out the points that weren't explicitly in data appendices. Um, and we did the conversions and other conversions to make sure that everything was side by side comparable. Um, so we'll start just with a couple of these macroeconomic um, uncertainties in the different scenarios. Uh, so GDP growth and population growth, these are fundamental drivers of final energy demand. Um, so the, the different scenarios have different outlooks on, on, uh, on these two factors. And there's some, uncertain, there's some uh, discrepancy between the different scenarios as to whether these are endogenous to the different scenarios or whether they're exogenous assumptions. So that kind of information is really useful to have. Um, but almost all the scenarios have this total primary energy demand um, outlook, and, and we collected everything, and, and mostly there through 2040. Um, and so I think I think the story of, of the decline of the near-term decline of coal in, in low-carbon scenarios um, is very clear. But what wasn't clear to me, at least until putting everything side by side, um, was the role of efficiency and actually reducing total um, energy demand uh, in the near term, and the story that that has in between the sort of central scenarios and the low-carbon scenarios. Um, on a more regional basis, we can break that down um, and look at what it means for energy GDP decoupling. Uh, all, almost all the authors you know, had, were, were, had some view of, of decoupling, um, and the main discrepancy there was how fast India and the non-OECD, non-China, rest of the world um, decouple energy consumption from GDP. Uh, so moving over now specifically to oil demand, we're going to look at oil and gas because these are most important for um, international oil companies. Um, the, the difference here you can see uh, is, is quite is, uh, between the amount of oil um, for transport. And we think the, last, the big story of especially the last year has been on light duty vehicle electrification. Um, so you can see here there's quite a spread uh, of outlooks um, from the different publishers. Uh, and we've had a lot of news in this last year. We've had 400,000 pre-sales in a month of the Tesla Model 3. Um, we had Ford just a couple weeks ago announce that by 2020, they were going to introduce 13 new electric vehicle models. Um, and you can see here that the outlook for Exxon and OPEC, for instance, is very, very different than the outlook um, for some of the other authors. Um, so what does this mean for um, oil production? So in the near term, oil production uh, in low carbon scenarios declines rapidly. Um, and obviously not all the central scenarios um, agree with that, that outlook. Um, but also, particularly for OPEC portion, um, by combining and comparing all the, all the scenarios, we get a bit of a consensus that uh, a low carbon scenario or a low oil price scenario means an increase in OPEC production. We can kind of flip that around and, and look at what that means for a long-term oil price. Um, and here we have uh, the scenarios for the, the sort of existing gray literature for oil price. Um, and we see that uh, low carbon scenarios represent this lower for longer outlook um, of the oil price being below $100 per barrel through to 2040. Uh, switching over to gas demand quickly, uh, we see lots of uncertainty around the amount of gas demand for industry and power. Uh, the future generating mix uh, purported by these different outlooks. Um, so gas here competing with coal, competing with uh, low carbon, which is nuclear and CCS, and competing with renewables. Um, and the one thing uh, that, that we, we would like to see more information on is uh, the role of LNG infrastructure in actually enabling this competition for gas. Um, we have a recent McKinsey report that says um, that LNG is going to be oversupplied for the next decade. Um, this means that infrastructure might not get built. So the ability of gas to actually make these gains in the, in the overall energy mix, um, we think is still quite uncertain. Um, this, is, this is the big one, obviously, carbon dioxide emissions. Um, you can see here almost uh, all the scenarios 
uh, show us bursting through any uh, two degree limit quite quickly. Um, and even, even scenarios that purport to be faster transition or uh, advanced technology scenarios still um, break through those two degrees limits. And the only, the only ones that explicitly stay within those limits are specifically two degree scenarios. Um, but what, what I think was interesting was looking back over sort of the history of projections and, and looking at the direction of travel. Um, so we went back through uh, five years of, of the World Energy Outlook um, projections and compared the projections for solar PV and wind capacity. And we can see that they've been amended upwards every single year. So the outlook for, um, for that amount of generating capacity has, has changed. Um, and then if we compare to the, uh, or let's just say at least on, and then even if we compare to the historic, um, the historic outcome of, of that uh, capacity, we, we see that this still even looks conservative, I would say, um, to, to think that uh, the future is even on 450 scenario um, going, to, going to be what they project. We can also do that for a total primary energy demand. So here's BP in 2030 and Exxon in 2040. We see we've got less nuclear year on year, but more renewables. And then coal, we're kind of changing our mind. Gas, we're not quite sure about. Um, and in the near term for the IA, that's a very similar story. Nuclear, we're not sure about. Renewables, yes. Coal, maybe we've changed our mind recently. Gas, maybe we've changed our mind recently. Um, but I think here, this is, the, this is sort of the big story at the end of the day, is that um, even though we're, um, that, that interplay between gas and coal and renewables and, um, and, and nuclear hasn't really moved the needle very much on these emissions outlooks. And uh, sort of by definition, you know, today's new policy scenario is tomorrow's uh, central policy scenario, but we didn't really see the needle move until this last World Energy Outlook. So I'm looking forward to the next World Energy Outlook, which will be the first post-Paris. That's going to be in November. Um, and then we'll, we'll send out a, a chart like this again to see where the needle's moved in a couple months' time. Um, so what are, what are sort of our, our collective findings um, from doing this exercise? Um, we find that there's a consensus now among the scenarios that a low carbon future is a low oil price future and is a high OPEC production future. Um, so this is really a perfect storm for international oil companies. Uh, we see a substantial gap exists between two degrees or, or low carbon uh, scenarios and sort of the central planning scenarios of some of these organizations. Um, and we say, okay, this reflects some skepticism on the ability of policymakers to deliver a two degrees transition. And if, even if we accept that, say, fine, accept that at face value, um, I think that the, uh, that the people behind um, or making decisions based on these scenarios need to be mindful of the rate of change, um, some of the direction of travel stuff. Um, otherwise, I think you could have company directors very soon uh, making decisions on scenarios that are obsolete. And so sort of the reluctance to publish more ambitious transition scenarios, I think will only do a disservice to the decision making as the direction of travel seems to um, be towards a lower carbon, uh, a lower carbon pathway. Um, interplay between renewables, low carbon, we've talked about, uh, but I think there's lots to talk about uh, with regards to transparency um, in, in, these, uh, in these outlooks and in these, in these scenarios. So I think, you know, just doing the exercise, there are some very basic things about how annoying it is to try to scrape together the data and, you know, convert all the units and all that sort of thing. Um, but because the carbon constraint is so strategically important for these different organizations, um, the amount of, of op uh, opacity in terms of what the actual assumptions are and the actual models that underlie some of these outlooks uh, make it very difficult, I think, to engage on, um, on, on sort of the correctness or, or the, the merits of the, of the different scenarios. Um, so we'd, like, we'd definitely be interested in seeing some kind of open modeling framework or some kind of peer review process um, for these gray literature uh, energy outlooks. Um, and basically, if, if Exxon is making investment decisions based on uh, a 10% uh, 10 percent electric vehicles in 2040 uh, eyes and investors would really want to know that and and i think uh, that needs to be part of the broader discussion on these topics um so what is next for us is we're going to build a decision support tool that allows people to sort of role play capital allocation um, and business model diversification and uh, shareholder dividend decisions through each of these scenarios um, and then we're going to bring that out and and role play that with uh, different groups so i invite you to contact us about it and uh, thank you very much On to um, our third uh, group of speakers. Um, so that's Jared uh, Kida and Which button is there? Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. It's my pleasure to be here. 
Um, the starting point of uh, the project that we're going to present on was actually a quantification of and tracing of um, cumulative historic emissions as a percentage of all industrial sources from fossil fuels and cement back to the original primary producers of the oil, gas, and coal, and in some cases cement, produced since 1854 to 2013 because we wanted to highlight how we can trace the quantitative contribution from primary producers as a starting point for leveraging their future action to reduce reserves. So if we take a look at the left-hand column, the uh, seven or so investor-owned and state-owned oil, gas, and coal companies contributed 148 gigatons of carbon dioxide since 1751 to the atmosphere if you deduct for their production of oil, gas, and coal. I mean, if you account for their oil, gas, and coal, but deduct non-energy uses of petroleum in particular. Now, uh, at the encouragement of Peter Fromhoff of Union of Concerned Scientists, we also wanted to take a forward look at what their stated and declared proven reserves of oil coal and gas would contribute if fully produced. So we took a look at the 70 investor-owned and state-owned oil, gas, and coal companies and added up their future production if fully exploited, and they would, they would add up to 255 gigatons of carbon out of a remaining carbon budget in 2013 of 275 gigatons of carbon. Now, the vast majority of that is for state-owned oil and gas companies and some state-owned coal companies as well. That's about 76% of the remaining carbon budget. And only about 16% is traced back to the investor-owned oil, gas, and coal companies that we all know as ExxonMobil and Peabody and, and such. Uh, and some of that work is detailed in the paper that I published in 2014 tracing atmospheric emissions, as well as the paper I did with Naomi Reskes last year on potential emissions from reserves. So if we look at some of those reserves, as well as their historic emissions, we see that the black columns are their historic contributions. So the largest companies historically have been Saudi Aramco, Chevron, ExxonMobil, etc. But if you add the emissions from their stated reserves in the red columns, plus methane and green, we see that the largest potential emissions come from the state-owned oil and gas companies. So we wanted to look at one particular company and see how, if they were to align its future emissions by ex exploitation of its reserves, what how they can align themselves with a science-based target for a downward path on emissions and production. So I'm cooperating with CDP in London to analyze one particular oil and gas company whose uh, state of reserves amount to 5 billion tons or so of carbon dioxide, again accounting for non-energy uses of some portion of their petroleum see how it can align its investments not only in future oil and gas and when their various levels of stated reserves will be exhausted, but also other investments in renewables and so forth. So I'm going to hand it over to Paul Griffin to explain the model that we developed. Thank you so much, Paul. So, uh, first of all, the Science-Based Targets Initiative is founded by CDP. Uh, at uh, World Resources Institute uh, and a product of the SBT initiative, sectorial decarbonisation approach, whereby the uh, science-based targets were disaggregated um, by contribution contributions sectors. However, the oil and gas sector was um, was not included in this uh, this first version. Um, so um, to to describe the concept of science-based targets um, for absolute emissions, um, the way in which um, a, path, a benchmark is allocated to a company is via the contraction method. Um, in, in, this, uh, in this way, a company's uh, historical emissions, um, no, sorry, uh, a company's emissions are 
benchmarked um, according to the same pathway as um, the global, um, as a global scenario, the IEA 2DS in this case, is simply contracted from the global level to the company level, so it's pro rata. Um, so what does this mean um, in terms of um, the implications for our company? Well, scope one plus three emissions are looked at here. Um, and we have in 2010 um, uh, nearly 250 megatons of CO2E. Um, scope one, by the way, is operational emissions, um, emissions under the uh, company's direct control. And scope three emissions for oil and gas um, is primarily from uh, the combustion of their products. Um, so the blue line is um, the IA2DS, and this is a um, science-based target line. And the 4DS is um, the orange line here. And you'll see um, that there are dots along this line. Um, the dots represent um, the locked-in emissions um, associated with um, the reserves portfolio of the company. So that 1P um, emissions that would uh, 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 will come from 1P emissions, um, the time at which um, that would take um, for that to be realized would be um, as it is indicated here. You'll notice that um, on the blue line, um, the dots are further spread apart. Um, and in fact, the 3P um, doesn't even feature on this chart because their 3P reserves the emissions locked in um, would actually surpass their entire um, 2050 budget um, for science-based budget. And if you were to move down this line into the 20, um, towards 2100, you'd find that um, any reserves portfolio would account for ever-increasing amounts of time because the sensitivity of that portfolio would increase as annual emissions pathway would reduce. Take longer for those emissions to be realized. So um, now to discuss the emissions intensity um, allocation method. And in this case, um, the company um, is um, um, is uh, converged with the uh, benchmark, um, with the science-based benchmark. Uh, starting from the base year, um, the company um, reaches the same intensity in 2050. Um, and in doing so, those, that, those are the other laggards. Um, company B um, would have more to do than the more carbon efficient companies, company A, um, uh, to reach the uh, production for 2050. So in terms of what this looks like, um, we, uh, here is uh, the base year. So starting from the base year here, uh, the blue line is, um, represent, is the, uh, the intensity represented um, uh, from our company, and um, the dotted line, the scenario. Um, the, and business as usual is how it would look, um, as you can see. Convergence path here starts from the base year and converges to the IA2DS, and this is um, emissions intensity of total primary energy production. So, um, in terms of ways in which um, a company, this company, could um, transition to um, attaining this um, science-based target, um, possibilities were modelled here: um, natural gas switching by 50%. Um, operational oil and gas efficiency, so scope one emissions, reducing that to zero. Um, you see that that doesn't make a huge amount of difference because scope one is far by far the smaller part of the total inventory. Uh, and then uh, renewable options and even a, a, re a reforestation offset um, potentially could, could add something to that. But even with these in place, there is um, a significant action remaining. So it, it, it implies a, a, large, a large ask to, uh, to meet that. The effect of CCS um, is to have changed ever so slightly the orientation, uh, the, the downward path here. But um, in this case, what I've done is the, um, uh, the amount of CCS uh, in natural gas production uh, within the scenario, within the 2DS scenario, is about 15%. Um, so applying uh, double that to natural gas combustion would reduce over time its emissions factor and thereby increase the effect of natural gas switching and reduce the, the, um, the BAU because um, there's already natural gas within the portfolio 
but there's still action remaining. So linking the two, contraction and convergence, together, this um, chart um, is of production mix of natural gas and oil, and shown as, alongside that is the intensity um, of that production mix. So we're a company to do nothing and continue as a business. Um, then what you'd see at the bottom there is that their budget to 2050 is exceeded, uh, to, and it's 10 gigatons of CO2. <coughs> so what ways can it stay within its budget? There are two ways. First of all, it could simply wind down production and thereby um, require, it would not be required for them to reduce intensity, but um, obviously they would not be able to grow as a business in that sense. And the other option is to continue to grow in terms of total output, but to diversify um, the production to low, car low carbon as well simultaneously, um, and in doing so reduce intensity. The implication of this is that it, the company follows both the contraction and the convergence together. Um, and in doing so, can sees itself less of, of less of less as an oil and gas producer, but more of as um, a primary energy producer. Cap on conclusions: Companies can begin to plan their transition around reserves lock-in, as you as you saw in uh, with dots. Uh, CCS provides a range of flexibility, but is obviously not the solution um, alone. It it simply has a limited effect on the total mix. Um, and oil and gas companies would need to follow both the contraction and convergence science-based target methods in order to continue growing and be prosperous um, uh, whilst uh, being science-based. Um, next steps on the modelling side, uh, to extend the analysis to 2100, modify scenarios so that we're looking um, at 1.5, 1.7 degree limit, um, and to consider further and to look at further consideration for company level allocation. And uh, for this, I refer to the carbon supply cost curve um, research by CTI, in which um, the lower cost oil um, is prioritized over higher cost oil in a, in a marginal cost curve, such that um, there's a variable um, allocation depending on the cost of the company's um, oil production. Um, so considering those, uh, that aspect as well. And to apply levelized cost assessment so the scenarios can actually themselves be costed as well. Thanks for listening. Okay, we've got uh, 20 minutes for uh, discussion. Number one, <laughs> number one, uh, Alicia Puyana from Flaxo, Mexico. I would like to ask uh, Paul, and thank you for all those beautiful presentations. Do you consider as well to change the structure of the oil market and gas market since res oil, gas, and coal reserves are so localized and concentrated? But for no renewables, land, uh, uh, sun, and uh, air, are not concentrated. Today, uh, oil market and gas and carbon markets are very concentrated. They are not competitive markets. Do you uh, assume a change in that uh, structure? Um, as it stands, the methodology doesn't um, distinguish between um, the uh, sort of the distribution or the concentration of resources. So that's something that um, we'd want to do to develop it and be more um, cognizant of that. And um, one of the things, uh, yeah, that I that I mentioned was the, the supply cost curve, but still um, that assumes a perfect market. So um, so no, there's um, lots of caveats um, that would come with the science-based target methodology because it can't be perfect and it has to be scalable as well um, and simple enough that that companies can follow it and that it can be uh, measurable and impartial. Uh, I think I was number two, also known as Harold Winkler from the Energy Research Centre, University of Cape Town. My question is to Lucas. If I understood you, you said in the two degree scenario there was a low oil price but high OPEC production. Just explain why there would be high production and whether that's foreseeing not being able to sell late or what's driving the high production. 
Um, sure. Uh, yes, yes, that is correct that um, there seems to be some consensus in, in the scenarios. Um, the idea is that um, under a low oil price, um, OPEC is going to be able to uh, take more market share or, or at least um, defend their market share. Um, and this is kind of reflective of a little bit, a return to a bit more economic fundamentals um, since uh, the oil price came down in 2014. Uh, they have the lowest cost um, supply base, um, and so then under a low price, um, they take more of the production. I'll talk tomorrow about a scenario. Uh, Christoph McGlade from the uh, International Energy Agency. One very quick comment, first of all, on your your rev uh, reviews, Lucas, of, of our projections. On the renewables side, the reason the new policy scenario has consistently increased the amount of renewables that's been deployed is because policies have constantly been ratcheted up. So if you look, go back to 2011, the renewable, the renewable policies that were in place were a lot weaker than they are now, and that's why we see this constant rising up. I'm more or less obliged to, to mention that because we are constantly criticised for for raising for, uh, for our renewables projections. And then two questions um, I think could, could go to anyone in the panel. The first one is, are oil and gas companies really in a good position to, to diversify towards wind, for example, as was mentioned, or towards non-core businesses for, for them? It, it strikes me that the risk portfolio for these different projects is completely different, and the, the oil and gas companies might be best placed. And secondly, kind of related to that is, how do you view the whether companies themselves should be required to produce two degree scenarios and how they, they should be have, how their business should, will be able to handle the two degree scenario? Do you think this is a positive move forward, or they should have to benchmark their their um, portfolio, their business towards something like a, a, a two degrees scenario, such as from from the IA? Uh, I, I do think that companies should be required, although that may have to come from shareholders demanding that companies do at least produce a 2 degree scenario. Uh, but you see a division between the US based and the Canadian companies as well as the European companies as to their <coughs> level of investment and interest in renewables versus continuing as an oil and gas company. Uh, I would say that the European companies are much more open to uh, increasing their portfolio. Stott Oil, for example, just offered a $200 million fund and diversifying towards the renewables. I would just add, I think there are many strategies that, that they can take. Um, and uh, just to, you know, to, to run for cash is, is a strategy or to diversify is another strategy. And then um, and they're going to have to choose um, whatever makes sense for them. Yeah, fourth place is notoriously the worst one, isn't it? Um, so, no, no, my question is for the whole panel, really. Um, what would you say to a, a fossil fuel major that came back to you saying, I mean, we, we heard various possible strategies a major could take, um, investing in renewables, runoff. Um, the third one, obviously, is investing seriously in carbon disposal, CCS, in the short term, um, more radical means of disposing of CO2 in the long term. If a carbon major said, we're going to be disposing of CO2 permanently, verifiably, uh, equivalent to 10% of the fossil content of what we sell and produce by 2030 or 2035 or some date like that. And after that, we're going to increase the sequestered fraction at a rate that's commensurate with reaching 100% sequestration before temperatures reach 2 degrees or whatever goal that the global governments agree. Would you then leave that company alone? Um, and if you would, maybe we should tell the companies that we would leave them alone if they did that. Um, they're not offering to do this at the moment, but if that offer was on the table, then um, we might get some more serious buy-in from companies uh, in putting their own resources behind this technology, which we are ultimately going to need. I, I would support that, Miles. And uh, if I were United Airlines, I might be switching my fuel buying to that company. Uh, yeah, I, I suppose um, just to to um, 
pick up where you left off and where companies want to go. They can be leaders or laggards. Um, whether they want to reinvest in totally new technologies such as renewables is a question, but there's also incremental technological innovation. So in oil sands production, we already have new, more efficient ways of producing um, and extracting oil, but there is this locking and, and path dependency. So renewables is part of the solution, but there's also ways of uh, increasing efficiency. Thanks, Jenny. Um, <clears throat> sorry, just returning to the question of whether or not oil and gas companies um, should diversify. I think there's a few reasons why they are well placed, so I'd agree with that. Um, I think Christophe made that point. Um, in terms of cost of capital, I mean, they still can raise cheaper capital often, um, but, but of course that relationship is, is changing quickly, and you can see that in some of the multiples being applied to equity uh, by the market switching quite quickly. Um, but I, I guess at a more structural level, their kind of paths to decision makers and their, the scale of resources they have to, which they can deploy quickly um, and on a global um, basis um, and their relationships with existing utility companies all put them in a strong position to quite quickly pick up with business, especially kind of building out of new, um, new capacity and, and, and new energy uh, frameworks within countries. They are quite well placed to do so. Um, uh, and then should companies be required to, um, to show how they're positioned? I, I think they should be. I mean, I think that companies should show how they are, how they're managing different kind of classes of risk um, in terms of, I mean, we've kind of published on this kind of idea quite recently in terms of physical risks faced, but kind of the, the, the transition risks and also liability risks, which is possibly a kind of more emergent thing in the future, as you can see with cases against Exxon and some other smaller oil and gas companies. Um, and, and so kind of demonstrating what the metrics are and their, their, um, their, their, their um, progress against those in terms of managing those risks would be, um, uh, would be a strong step. And I, I mean, I guess, I guess all companies should do that, but particularly ones in certain sectors which are more acutely exposed to transition in the energy system. Better than four, but... Great. Thank you. Peter Frumhoff at the Union of Concerned Scientists. So really this is primarily a question for Paul and, 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 and Rick. I, I'm, I'm pleased to see that you're beginning to develop, the, say, the CDP et al. initiative, uh, 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 sexual decarbonization or two-degree pathway for the oil and gas industry, fossil fuel industry. Um, I know with the other decarbonization or sectoral reduction pathways, you've had quite a lot of uptake from companies, something like 180 <laughs> Uh, companies have made commitments to reduce emissions, including some significant multinationals. Is the development of this decarbonization or two-degree pathway um, a reflection of a dialogue that's now happening with the uh, fossil fuel companies about a willingness, perhaps, to take on reduction commitments? Has that happened yet? Are you seeing any movement, or is this really in advance of and in the hopes of being able to encourage that? Uh, Paul might answer this as well, but uh, to my knowledge, no, there's just some study in certain companies that are exploring what it would mean for them, but I haven't seen any public commitments by any oil and gas company to do so. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty sparse. The only one that, um, the only company that we're aware of that has produced something um, that can be debatably at least um, uh, uh, described as two degrees or science-based is total um, but um, I, I've looked over the um, methodology and um, of, of their of their approach and actually um, it's there yeah someone said there's more than one way to skin a cat um, and basically there's there's lots of a myriad of ways that you can sort of make the the path a little bit shallower um, and in fact um, and in this case, um, whereas I was looking at sort of the boundary of total primary energy production, so how the intensity would reduce to 2050, given um, these these options of not just oil, gas, and coal, but um, hydro, nuclear, um, you know, solar, wind, and so on. Um, well, total um, in their assessment decided to exclude from their options hydro and nuclear because they didn't see themselves going into that, uh, which is, they may have their reasons and legitimate reasons um, from their perspective, but what the effect of that is, is that the benchmark becomes a shallower intensity reduction. Um, so there needs to be a way of standardizing it, but um, yeah, there's not much um, activity in the from the sector, so this is starting the conversation to engage them further.
Uh, bear in mind too that there might be some emerging legal pressure on companies to uh, see the, let themselves be seen as climate stewards. Uh, and that might propel some action to not only study but make public amendments to uh, lower the future emissions. Hi, Pete Erickson with Stockholm Environment Institute. And I've heard the term science-based targets before, but I admit I hadn't really looked into it much. So I thanks, thanks for your presentation uh, and introduction to it. And it was really, I was excited about it, but it also was sh shocking in a way because it seemed to me that it imply, it, it carries with it this implication or assumption that if every company just starts from where they are, and you know, starts reducing some that somehow we can get to, to two degrees. And it, it seems to me that that's problematic for a couple of reasons. One is it ignores the free riders that aren't gonna take that path. And, and then it, it seems like it also steps aside the fact that really some companies and some whole industries don't have anything like the same place that they have now in a low carbon economy. You know, certainly the coal industry, but parts of the oil and gas industry too. So I wonder if you could comment on how y you address that in the, you know, in your communication around this or even in the work itself going forward. Yeah, I, I agree that if uh, every company had a plan and, and that they actualized their commitments to abide by science-based targets, we wouldn't actually achieve the goal so I think it's incumbent on, on industry to go a bit further. We just see this scenario as a starting place and we want to follow up with what, what it means to reduce those objectives below two degrees uh, and go on from there. But I agree, I agree with your point. I'm Greg Muttet with Oil Change International. I've, I've got a technical question for Rick which is you, you showed a, a number for proven reserves, which was about 250 gigatons of carbon. And I wanted to check what definition you're using there, because on most definitions, it's uh, the global reserve is, I think, somewhere between six, 600 and 800 gigatons of carbon, or between two and 3,000 gigatons of CO2. So I'm wondering, is that just from your list of companies, those reserves? And if I may, I've also got a question for, for Lucas, which is um, on the slide you showed of the historic growth of renewable energies and the IEA's forecasts. Um, the, the striking thing there for me was that the historic growth is, is showing the, the classic S-curve shape of a new technology. It's accelerating upwards. We don't know whether it's going to keep going exponentially, getting a steeper curve, or whether it's uh, going to grow on a straight line. And at some point, it will, it will flatten off. What all of those IEA projections had was it flattening off rel relatively soon which would imply a saturation uh, of, of the power market somewhere around 10 or 20 percent, I think, and the oil company forecasts are the same. So my question is, have, have, you, have you tried extrapolating those technology S-curves to, to see what assumptions they're making about where renewables ultimately end up? Yeah, thanks, Greg, uh, for that question. Let me try to clarify. The Emissions I showed at 255 gigatons is only for the 70 companies that have the facilities and, and um, the investments and the infrastructure able to produce those reserves, and they're on their books. What I excluded were uh, at least 185 gigatons of carbon owned by com uh, countries in which companies, we don't have data for the companies themselves, such as all of Chinese uh, coal, manufa coal production, for example, is outside of, of that column, as well as Poland and Kazakhstan and, uh, and North Korea, for example, and their coal infrastructure. So I'm only looking at the investor-owned and state-owned companies. Uh, yeah, sure, on, um, on S-curves. Um, so I think um, well, I, I, I invite, there are people in the audience who can probably answer this question better than I can. Um, but I think there are many types of, uh, first of all, for modeling S-curves, there's many types of sigmoid functions. Uh, so depending on which one you choose, uh, 
you end up with a different peak, you end up with a different midpoint uh, inflection point. Um, and they all, when you, when you have a nice little exponential curve like that, you can pretty much fit any S-curve that you like to it with, with a reasonable degree of, of correlation. So, um, so it makes it very difficult to, to choose. And then particularly in, uh, in renewables, in the penetration of renewables, um, I think there are other sigmoid curves that are sort of hidden within that one curve because um, basically we know the, the, the peak penetration of renewables will depend on a lot of other technologies that are at that very bottom of their own sigmoid curves at the moment. Um, so we don't know when we're going to see an, expo an explosion in storage or flexible generation or um, high voltage DC, that kind of thing, that will actually impact the renewables curve. Hi, Samantha Smith from the Just Transition Center in the International Trade Union Confederation. I think I worked for the company that was the, the model for your, for your study there. So I have some thoughts, but I will corner you guys in a break and ask some questions. Um, I have another question, really, which can be for a few people on the panel. And it's this. So oil companies are primarily valued by their reserves today. So as you're looking at this transition pathway, do you have any thoughts about how investors might react to this move from valuing a company based on its reserves to valuing it based, for example, on a pipeline of wind power projects? So that's, that's one question. How would you see that playing out? Would that be something very dramatic? That's a bit of the stranded assets theory. Or is that something that you think could be managed? Um, okay. Um, not specifically. I mean, um, there haven't been large-scale examples yet of how the market would react because not oil, no oil companies have done renewables in any, in any great scale. Um, I can't, I mean, I'm trying to think of precedents of where we've moved from kind of an asset-based valuation to a revenue-based valuation. Um, uh, I mean, I can't, is it problematic for the market to do that? Possibly um, in the short term there could be some kind of undervaluation or kind of froth on those companies, but I... I, I can't see a specific problem with them in terms of managing a transition um, for those companies to that. I mean, it may be that it's a time for them to communicate clearly what their company's worth based on terms of future projections of lo locked-in contracts with utility companies or something. Thank you very much for your presentation uh, regarding actors. I think that's important instead of just looking at countries. Um, the question is, uh, talking about oil companies, what, is, what did you see in your study about the relationship, not just uh, to see them as companies, but as companies owned in a certain way or with institutional arrangements different between each other, specifically uh, how they relate to the country of their origin? And if, if you saw that, if you could just say a short thing about how that could change the results or if there will be differences. Yeah, it's not something that I have uh, looked at closely, but uh, it's pretty clear that government policies have a strong impact on how their state-owned company will, will act, whether it be Venezuela or Norway or, or Saudi Aramco. Um, so to the extent that we can pressure the national governments to institute policies that makes sense in lieu of climate stewardship, all the better. And that comes internally to the company, uh, uh, particularly in Norway, for example, where, where this majority shareholder is the, the government, and how it interacts with the company and the company's internal goals. Hi, my name is uh, Gertrude Kramer. Yeah, my name is uh, Gertrude Kramer. I'm since, as of recent, an academic, but uh, until early this year, I worked for Shell, one of the oil and gas uh, companies uh, that, that uh, came. I can say from working there uh, that there is um, 
uh, no shortage of uh, careful uh, analysis of the climate predicament uh, and on forward thinking of uh, how companies can respond. I think what's a bit missing uh, in, in the present uh, analysis is uh, the, the notion, which I'm sure is in the back of your minds, uh, that after all, CO2 is a commons problem, right? Which means uh, that individual parties uh, find it simply difficult, the way the world is, to, to act on it. That is in particular true uh, for fossil fuel companies, because yeah, companies are held to account to do the things they are good at uh, and provide the products that the market caters for. So uh, at some point during the discussion, uh, there was the remark, shouldn't uh, companies um, have state sort of uh, ambitions on emissions or portfolios, etc. Uh, I think they would very happily do that, right? If, if there were actually uh, consumers who are likely to back that up. Uh, the, the case of CCS, came to the fore, I, I know that Shell and the others would like nothing better uh, to, than to get going with it. Uh, the, the problem is uh, there is no mechanism to recover the cost. Uh, so that is a problem that cannot be denied. And I think when it comes, because there is in this an aspect of morality, right, shouldn't companies do this or that, I think it is a very positive sign that I think virtually all independent oil majors uh, now in one way or the other speak out publicly for carbon pricing. Uh, it took them perhaps a long time to get towards that point, but it's very good that they are there. Uh, and I know from inside that uh, the fr fr frustration is that politicians don't act on it. So. Miles, Miles, would you like to contribute something? Oh, yeah. Very quick. Yeah. I mean, yeah, as we think of it today, there's no mechanism to recover the cost of CCS. There was no mechanism to recover the cost of double-hulled tankers in the early 1970s. The industry collectively agreed to introduce them because they knew that they were no longer going to get a license to continue to operate unless they did so. So CCS needs to become a license of operation of fossil fuel extraction. Until we get to that point, we're not going to solve the problem. So I want to ask, uh, so for the past two years I've been in conversation with five of the largest oil companies in Canada about decarbonization and two degree pathways. And what I've come to realize is that when they talk about decarbonization, their vision is the decarbonization of oil. That, they, that, they're, that what they're talking about is reducing emissions, both at the production end and at the consumption end. I mean, they're actually investing in CCS in the trunk. Um, this idea that somehow we're going to reduce emissions to such an extent that they can increase production of oil in the future. And, and, I, and, and so I, I raise that because I, I think that there is a cultural and strategic barrier for the big incumbents to doing big plays into clean tech venture capital or renewable energy because they have to admit then that they will have stranded assets or that climate policy will, will succeed. And, and I don't know, given the valuation that they have of their companies, how to overcome that barrier. Because I think we need them. We need their capital. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, Noam Bergman, University of Sussex. Um, Lucas, you mentioned this difference between mainstream scenarios and two degrees scenarios. Um, arguably, that difference is why we're here. So w what are the key qualitative points between the two? I guess my question. So, um, I can only get three responses here, so not five. So. Yeah, let me just say that we all need to contribute personally as well as in terms of our corporations to commit to participate in, this, in the solutions. If that means choosing a petrol provider that makes a public stand for climate stewardship, we should favor those consumers, I mean those, those producers. Um, sure, on, on key qualitative points, I would say one of the key qualitative points is a skepticism of policy um, that will actually enact 
uh, that, that kind of pathway. A little bit off of divestments, but um, the key incumbents, the energy biggest uh, energy oil producers, have a vested interest in carbon capture storage because it allows them to continue with status quo. We have a question of consumers, what are the choice? In the divestment movement, you do see investors pulling out and saying that, look, we'd rather put our money in another, um, uh, let's say, low carbon pathway. Uh, this is what um, you can say from the bottom-up approach. We need, there isn't one particular approach, we need all approaches. We need incumbents to be involved, we need carbon capture storage, and we need more pressure on the biggest emitters. So please join me in thanking uh, <laughs>